<laughs> so we're not online. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, and here we go. So hello, students and teachers, and welcome to the second online event with Tom Franklin, author of the best-selling novel, Crooked Letter, Crooked Letter. My name is Sophia Kumla. I work for the DIE Tübingen, and I will make sure that everything runs smoothly and without any technical difficulties. Today's event is hosted by the four German-American institutes in Baden-Württemberg, namely the DAI Heidelberg, the Karl Schurz Haus Freiburg, the DRZ Stuttgart, and the DAI Tübingen. If someone has not heard of us yet, the DAIs are independent cultural and educational institutions that have made their mission to provide information about the USA and German-American relations. For this purpose, each institute organizes various events which contributes to a better understanding of the ideals, values, and culture of both countries. In addition, I would like to briefly draw your attention to the various programs designed for you, teachers and students. All four institutes have an English-speaking library as well as e-library, offer teacher trainings, multiple language courses, or summer camps designed for students, and they have individual school projects such as Rent an American or America Explained. And lastly, I would like to point out the DID Tübingen's youth trip to San Diego this summer for students between 15 and 19 year olds. We are traveling for three weeks to the beautiful city of San Diego and get to know the American way of life firsthand. Check out our websites. You can find all the links down below in the info box and of course on social media and see what's offered near you. And now finally to today's event. I am very happy that Tom Franklin agreed to do another online reading tour. If you have questions for Tom, please feel free to write them in the YouTube chat and he will try to answer them later. And now it is with great pleasure that I introduce you to today's two main speakers. Firstly, of course, our guest of honor, Tom Franklin. And secondly, I am happy to introduce Ms. Inge Strass. She's the department head of the Seminar für Ausbildung und Fortbildung der Lehrkräfte Tübingen, and to which I hand it over now. So thank you both for being here with us today. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody here in Germany. And also good morning again to Tom, for whom it's very early, it's seven o'clock in Mississippi. Um, as Sophia has just said, I'm Inge Strass, a former teacher at uh, the Wildemuth Gymnasium and teacher trainer at the Seminar in Tübingen. And I have the great pleasure to guide you, everybody here through today's event. We will hear Tom Franklin, who has joined us uh, from Oxford, Mississippi. And he will talk about his novel, Crooked Letter, Crooked Letter, and answer your questions, as Sophia has already said as well. Um, we've got quite a few questions already from um, courses that were submitted um, earlier on, uh, but do ask your questions and we'll try and cover them um, as they come along. Um, first, let me say a few words about uh, our renowned guest, Tom uh, Franklin, and set the stage for his talk. Uh, I suppose everybody has read his novel for the upcoming Abitur, and you've also found out a little bit about uh, Tom himself. Um, he was born and raised and educated in a small town in the US South in Alabama. He started writing and um, about the region as well. That's why some people um, also call him a regional writer covering the South, but he wrote crime fiction, he wrote uh, short stories, other novels. He um, co-wrote a novel together with his wife, Beth Ann Fennelly, who's a poet. Uh, it's called The Tilted World. And of course, he's also won lots of prizes. Um, I'll just mention a few, uh, the ones he got for Crooked Letter, Crooked Letter, which was uh, published in 2010. It was a New York Times bestseller. It, it won the Los Angeles Times Book Prize, received the Willie Morris Award for Southern Fiction, the RT Reviewers Choice Award for Best Contemporary Mystery, 
and also a prize from across the ocean, the UK Crime Writers Association Gold Dagger Award. Lovely title, I think. Um, presently, he works at the University of Mississippi. He teaches creative writing and um, is, I think fiction writing mainly. But it's certainly not the list of books or a list of prizes that will make today's event uh, memorable to us. But Tom's um, gift for spontaneous storytelling and of capturing our attention while doing so. This way, we can relate to his life and his work. Maybe we find things we share or questions that bewilder us. For me, the thing we share is growing up in a small village, a small place where everybody knows everybody else and where if you fit in, you have a strong sense of belonging. But if you don't fit in, if you are the outsider, then life can be quite harsh. So since Tom grew up in a small place as well, that's where I feel I can easily relate to him. Yet my village somewhere in Bavaria um, had a very homogeneous society. Everybody was white, most people were into farming and uh, everybody had a family. So that was quite, um, quite an easygoing life. I know that Tom's uh, setup of society was very different. The place was half white and half black. And I find it, of course, I find it a little difficult to, re to relate to that. But since we, there are books like Crooked Letter, Crooked Letter, uh, which portray small town life in the US South, um, that helps me to imagine what it may have been like still. There is a cultural gap. And uh, sometimes when reading, I'm aware of this gap. Sometimes maybe I'm not. And then uh, when we are not aware of uh, such gaps, we might misunderstand uh, the characters, why they act like they do. And um, then we misjudge them. Becoming aware of these gaps and these cultural differences and then bridging the gaps is of understanding that is the aim of an event like today's event. So um, let's see what the similarities are and become aware of the cultural differences and bridge the gaps. And with this, I'd like to hand over to uh, Tom Franklin now, who I'm sure will enlighten us and also entertain us. And maybe Tom, Perhaps you could start with telling us a little bit about the place where the story is set and um, the setup of society there. Sure. Um, thanks, Inga, for hosting and Sophia for um, doing all the technical um, mastery, uh, something I could never do. I'm happy to, and I want to thank the DAI again, a wonderful organization. I hope you all will take advantage of its many um possibilities. Um, for your first question, Inga, I will show you um, this picture. I think I, you can see it pretty well. Mm -hmm. This is me at about age 12, maybe 13. And that's my brother behind me. You can't see him, but behind him is my younger cousin. But these trees are all, uh, these are all beautiful hardwoods. Um, and this is a railroad track in Dickinson, Alabama, where I'm from. The railroad track, if you follow it back away from where, you know, uh, in the other direction from where we're walking, it would um, pass the store. And the store um, was the hub of Dickinson, Alabama, where I'm from. I think Inga says probably only 300 people lived there, probably a few more now. It's a community um, and it just it was made of the people. The store was there with a post office connected. The train ran right behind it. Beyond that was a graveyard. And that was the whole of Dickinson, Alabama, that and the houses. And as Inga said, about half white, half black lived there. And we were mostly um, segregated. There was an area where black people lived and an area where white people lived. There were two churches, both Baptist and um, one for white, one for black. 
but we did, you know, we did mix and mingle. Um, I went to school at the public schools in uh, in Grove Hill, a nearby town, and uh, went to school with black kids. Um, so in Dickinson was a very different world then than it is now. Um, now all those trees are gone. They were cut for lumber and they've planted cheap loblolly pine trees that are growing again. And they're probably about 20 years old now and can probably be harvested in another 10 or 15 years. And it will be another um, empty area. So to me, it's very sad that my childhood is gone in that way. The landscape where I grew up is not there anymore. It's just a bunch of ugly, sad um, trees. There's not nearly as much shade as there was. And on that railroad track, um, the train still goes. It still uses the track, but it doesn't stop in Dickinson anymore. It goes right on by Dickinson. And I was at that... Um, that's a trestle, you see, which is um, a railroad um, track over water. It's a, a, a train bridge. And I was at, back at this train bridge about a year ago with my brother and another cousin fishing off of um, the trestle into the water. Um, so Dickinson was a great place to have grown up in. It's a great place for someone who grew up to be a writer to have been from. Again, I... I, I it's a sadder place now, but I think that's true with a lot of rural areas. Um, and the novel Crooked Letter, Crooked Letter came out of my childhood in Alabama um, at some point when I decided to call the book Crooked Letter, Crooked Letter, which is how um, you probably know how children are taught to spell Mississippi, M-I, Crooked Letter, Crooked Letter, I. Crooked letter, crooked letter I, humpback, humpback I. Crooked letters are S's, humpbacks are P's. And that's how we were taught to spell uh, Mississippi. But once I thought I, I had this book I was working on, it was about two brothers. Once I decided to call it crooked letter, crooked letter, I had to push it east into Mississippi. That's not a big issue because Mississippi and Alabama are very similar. The landscapes are, are almost identical. Um, the one difference is uh, in the north, Mississippi has hills, Alabama has mountains in the north. And um, in the south, the coast of Alabama is nicer than the coast of Mississippi is all. Otherwise, in the middle, they're, they're really the same landscape. So moving it from Alabama to Mississippi was not difficult to do. Um, and I think uh, um, I wrote most of this book in Brazil my wife got a Fulbright grant down there to that country and took me and our two kids at the time. Now we have three kids. And I had a lot of free time because she was teaching, but I had nothing to do except write. So I had every day free to write. If I'm at home, I have so many distractions, friends and, and bars and restaurants and students. But um, down in Brazil, where I couldn't speak the language, I felt essentially trapped. Um, at in the area where I was writing. And so I just did nothing but write. And eventually this book began to write itself in a way. And I felt like I was just along for the ride for part of it. There'd be new pages every day. And um, the cool thing that began to happen is that I was in South America writing about the American South. And I was out of my comfort zone, as I said. At home, if I was stuck on my writing, I would go for a walk in the woods and I would see something in the woods that would make me think and, and remind me of something and I could go home and write about it. But down in Brazil, we were in a city called Belo Horizonte, a beautiful city. Down there, um, it was just me and my imagination. I couldn't go for a walk and, and see a black snake or a green snake and go home and write about it. I, you know, the snakes down there were different. I didn't know them. And so I turned inward and began um, unconsciously or subconsciously, without any intention anyway, to write about my own life. And suddenly things that had happened to me, to Tom Franklin, began to happen to the character of Larry Ott. And suddenly Larry Ott and I began to have more and more and more things in common. 
like I, Larry loved Stephen King, um, comic books, drawing, uh, everything about Larry became things about me. In fact, um, I remembered one morning this very cold um, January in Alabama when I was probably about this age. I probably looked just like that, but it was January, so I was dressed in warm clothes, and my father drove my brother and sister and me to school every day for that year. For that year, there was no school bus for some reason, so my father drove us to the school, the public school in Grove Hill, about um, a seven-mile drive, about 10, 12 minutes away. Well, one of these cold January mornings, when we're getting to my father's truck, he cranked it up and we drove. And at the store I mentioned, uh, there's a sharp turn in the road. And standing at that turn was a black woman and her daughter. And they were standing and they were so cold that my father gave them a ride. Of course he did. This is, you know, this is um, Al rural Alabama where people help each other regardless of race. And there's no public transportation there. There wasn't then, there isn't now. So they had to hitchhike to get where they were going. And what I remember is once they got into the truck, there were suddenly now six of us in one truck and we were very crowded and they smelled like wood smoke. And I understood that their only heat in that very cold day came from the fireplace wherever they were living. And I felt bad for them. I knew that must have been difficult. Well, my father dropped them off in Grove Hill, dropped us off at school. Our mother picked us up as she always did and drove us home. We didn't think about the woman and her daughter, or at least I didn't. But the next morning they were there and they were there the morning after that. And we get, gave them rides. And finally, they weren't there. And I don't know what happened to them. We never saw them again. Mm -hmm. But I think everybody listening now remembers yeah. the scene from the book. So you actually took uh, events from your own life and changed them around a little bit. But uh, they are that's, yeah, that's that's one example. Just you know, just um, as I began to sit in um, in, in Brazil and try to write, mm -hmm. this this um, instance presented itself to me, and I remember and I remember thinking, oh, this is when the two boys meet for the first time. I made. The, you know, I, the woman, instead of having a daughter, I gave her a son and that became Silas. And so that's, again, one of the many ways Larry and I, things Larry and I have in common. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that, you know, that happened and many other things happened. So I do think that students and readers will recognize that that is a similar event between Larry Ott and Tom Franklin. Larry certainly has some, you know, um, difficulties in his life and his sense of belonging is something that uh, has to be, or should have been strengthened. He tried so many things uh, to establish a sense of belonging, but he failed. Do you think that he could have done anything to change people's opinion of him? I don't know. I do know that he tries too hard. He tries too hard to make people notice him, uh, as I did. Another example is Larry bringing that monster mask to school on Halloween. He does that to try to make people notice him. And for that day, they did notice him. Uh, as with me, I, I brought my monster mask to school on Halloween one day, and everyone wanted to try it on and scare people. And for that, you know, for those moments, I uh, attained a kind of popularity. And as Larry was in the novel, I was invited that night to a haunted house to participate, to scare people. You know, for Halloween, we have um, these people set up haunted houses and you pay money and go in and get scared for a while. And these are very popular. And I didn't realize that they did that. And I didn't understand. I remember going to the haunted house and seeing all these people from school And I realized that they hung around, they hung out. They were friends outside of school. I wasn't really friends with any of them outside of school. Mm -hmm. So I was surprised at these relationships that extended beyond the 7.30 to 3.30 school window. And uh, it kind of hurt my feelings. I hadn't realized that. And uh, I remember I scared everybody. I had a real good time for a couple of hours. And, then, and when I came out of the haunted house at the end of the night, People were standing in groups 
and girls were sitting in, in boys' laps and people were passing beer around. And uh, I felt very apart and very separate from everyone. And I remember nobody really called me into their group and said, hey, good job, come on. So I just went home alone as Larry does. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think that Larry, you know, like I tries too hard and that makes him unattractive to um, any possible friends. But, you know, also Larry um, is a nerd with comic books and science fiction novels and Tarzan novels. And I was a nerd. But um, in the in this time period, in the mid to late 1970s in Alabama, and I think most places in, in the United States, being a nerd was not cool. It was dangerous. It's cool to be a nerd. Now, there are whole websites and podcasts devoted to nerddom, um, Emergency Awesome and Nerdist News. They're all about nerds and everyone, you know, it's cool now to like superheroes and comic books. I have lots of comic books behind me. Yeah. That's cool now. But when I was a kid, it wasn't cool. And it's not cool for Larry. So Larry is um, trying too hard. He's a nerd. And I think finally, you know, the things he's interested in, other folks are not interested in, except for his one friend, Silas, who they do form a bond briefly, simply because of their circumstances. And I had a friend like Silas. He was um, a black boy named Wayne Coates. Wayne and I were the two nerds in our class. It just happened that he was black and I was white. Um, for me, what's really sad is we were not able to be friends. Uh, we were not the same kind of friends we could have been had we both been white, had we both been black. Because we were different races, we both felt this difference. And we felt everyone noticing our friendship, or at least I did. So it was um, it was difficult. And I was lonely at school. And just remember that, you know, the stench of loneliness, the stench of sadness is off putting. So I think for all those reasons, um, Larry really couldn't have fit in, though he tried. I do want to make one uh, um, note, one caveat about the difference between Larry and me, where Larry is excruciatingly lonely, where Larry's lonely at school. He's also lonely at home. Mm -hmm. His father doesn't like him. So he feels that he's very sensitive and smart and feels that. And um, I was different in that I had that brother you saw in that picture and that cousin behind him and other cousins. And I had friends in the neighborhood in Dickinson who weren't friends really at school. But when we were home, we hung out together. So that's a, that's quite a big difference between Larry and me. And I also had, unlike Larry, I had a very good father. Larry has a mean, alcoholic, abusive father. But what do Larry and Silen really have in common? Or what, what are aspects that are connecting them in the novel at the beginning? And, and then why does that friendship, why can it not be carried on? Um, I think they're, you know, the, the, what they, the big thing they have in common is a, the same father. They have that. Of course, neither one knows that. I think Larry suspects it. They have that in common, but also, you know, they have geography in common too, because, um, they're in the same area. They have this rifle in common, the one that, that Larry loans to Silas and, and doesn't get back for about 25 years they have in common that they are both um, in their own way pariah. You know, Silas is good looking and strong and athletic and does well at school, but at home, he's as lonely as Larry is. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, and they turn to each other because they need each other. But when Silas doesn't need Larry anymore. He turns away from Larry because I think because of the reasons that everyone else would turn to Larry. Um, so in a way, they don't have that much in common, really. Silas, in fact, uses Larry, I would say, for a while. Um, so Silas and Wayne Coates, my friend, are quite different. I didn't get I, I didn't give Silas the nerdist qualities that Larry has, although Wayne had them. 
um, maybe I should have. Um, maybe I should have given Silas more artistic ability. I don't know. That might have made him a deeper and more complicated person. There's always these worries at the end, what you should have done, what I didn't do well enough, what I could have done better. Well, would you call Silas a coward since he um, steals away and uh, never tells um, people that Larry is, he could have, you know, he, he could have told people that Larry is innocent, but he didn't. That's cowardly, isn't it? It's certainly uh, abhorrent. Anyway, um, I would. I, I don't think Silas is. I, I see Silas um, in in two, two ways. One, when he's a boy, and he's in real physical danger if he is dating a white girl, and he might something might have happened to him because of that. So I, I understand the fact that he left. I think, he, and well, I know his mother got him out of there. His mother made him leave. Leaving Dickinson, I do not think was cowardly, yet coming back and seeing what Larry's life has become mm -hmm. and understanding, as Silas does, that he has some um, culpability there. Uh, um, I, I, I think that his not, his not calling Larry back, his not reaching out to Larry is a terrible, terrible thing that he does or doesn't do. I think he certainly could have um, answered Larry's calls and talked to Larry. But I think I, I think he's more ashamed than afraid. Uh, and I think that shame and cowardice are different things. I think that it's Silas sees it um, as an adult. He sees it as being so complicated and tangled and twisted that, you know, at some point you can't pull the roots up. They go so deep. I just don't know that he knows how he could rectify this. And I am aware that he only confesses because he's confronted. You know, and I wonder if 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 he had not been confronted in that hospital room, he would have ever confessed his shame. Um, but again, I, I would call it shame more than cowardice. Perhaps, and I think the two are certainly related, you know, one would be afraid because of one's shame. One's shame causes fear, you know, of, of being um, found out. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you think Larry means a lot to Silas? Or does he just want to, you know, get rid of this shame, want to clear his conscience? So he's, he's not really making up for his mistake, is he? No, I don't even think he knew there was a mistake until he moved back. Only when he moved back did he see what had happened. Mm -hmm. At this point, it's just so big and so out of control that it, you know, it, it might really upend everything mm -hmm. um, in, in Silas's own life. But I do think that, I do think that, you know, he needs Larry. I think that Larry is his only family, um, his half-brother, and we all need family. Silas just doesn't know yet that he needs him. I think toward the end of the novel, he begins to realize this, and I certainly think Angie, Silas's girlfriend, realizes this and is trying to push him in the right direction. She sees things in him that are worth... Um, shaping you know that she thinks he's worth her time she can make him a better person and i think that she ultimately will and i think he has really good qualities but needs to be pushed in the right direction so as you're telling us now there's a chance for real reconciliation between the two men silence and larry uh, yes absolutely there is in my head i see them fishing together in a in a in a, in a an aluminum boat so <laughs> at some point I, I know that will happen um I, I think that that um you know and and the book even ends with them setting up another meeting Silas is going to drive back out in that old jeep and buy a carburetor kit and larry will fix it for him and while larry fixes it with his with the jeep's hood up in the air Silas will stand there and watch him and they'll talk and Larry will describe what he's doing to the carburetor. And 
he will probably fix another couple of things that the Jeep needs so that when Silas drives away in that Jeep, it will run a lot better. And he will understand that Larry's helped him and that Larry has so much to give. And Silas will return. I do know that. Thanks for this picture of the future of these two guys. <laughs> Let's move on to the to the women in the book, perhaps. There. Let's talk about Cindy. What made you decide not to confirm her fate? That was a that was a very conscious decision. Um, I could have um, implied more strongly that Cecil, in fact, strangled his stepdaughter when she came home from this date. That's probably that's what the book implies. I guess I could have implied it stronger, but I wanted to leave it um, up in the air because so many things in real life are not answered. Not every question has a satisfying answer to it. Um, also, you know, if if we had knew, if we had known what happened to Cindy, that would have changed Larry's life. If there had been a body, he probably would have been charged. Or if there had been a body, there may have been forensic evidence to link it to Cecil. Mm -hmm. So the, you know, her not being found is one of the main plot points that keeps Larry being scary Larry. It keeps him being the pariah that he is. Um, so, yeah, I, 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 I chose to keep Cindy a mystery, but that also allows me as the writer, the same person who can imagine Larry and Silas fishing in an aluminum boat on the Alabama River, I can also imagine that Cindy is gone away and is very happy. And I, I, I see her in Brazil, where in a way she was born, you know, at least the character was, was I, I thought of the character of Cindy in Brazil. So it seems apt. It seems apropos to return her there. I think that that night after the, the, the date, the night she's never seen again in uh, Mississippi, she hitchhiked, got a ride from a nice person, got another ride, got down to Mobile, somehow got herself on a plane to Brazil. It's only two hours time difference between Central Eastern time or Central Standard Time in my country to Brazil straight down. So she got there in a, in a few hours and she never came home. She fell in love with a, a, a woman, an older woman who's an artist. And Cindy discovered herself uh, as an artist, a great visual artist with <laughs> um, paints, with oil paints. And um, she's happily married and um, rarely thinks of um, Mississippi anymore. <laughs> that's that's how you imagine her now after publishing the book. But the book itself is, of course, uh, implies that uh, Cecil murdered her, killed her. What would have been his motives for doing so? He is um, attracted to her. You know, it, it, she's not his uh, natural child, um, but his stepchild. He doesn't have the father's instinct he has um a drunk's instinct so he's attracted to her and he feels some uh interior turmoil about that he knows that that's wrong he's also uh, a racist and he knows that she has dated um this black boy and that makes him angry so the, you know, his own attraction his drunkenness and his anger is just a perfect storm for poor cindy Okay, I'd like to go on to uh, Wallace now. Um, and, and our topic of belonging, how does the relationship of Wallace um, and Larry affect Larry's sense of belonging? Does it change his life? In yes. Um, becoming friends with Wallace changes Larry's life in every way, obviously, you know, apart from the, the, the plot of the novel, you know, meeting Wallace is what sets everything into uh, most of the events into uh, into motion. Um, but Larry is just so excruciatingly lonely that even someone as toxic, as poisoned, as dangerous, as monstrous as Wallace is someone to listen to. And what Wallace wants, what he needs is a kind of mentor. He needs someone to look up to a father figure, an older brother, 
And he grew up without a father. He grew up with a mother who dated lots of different men. And Wallace, as a boy, would often wake up on different men's sofas when his, while his mother was in the bedroom with whatever man it was. And then she would drag him to church because she felt guilty about what she was doing. And while this is Wallace's upbringing, fatherless, um, very poor, um, moving from town to town, school to school. So he does not have a solid basis. Um, he was not brought up well, not reared well. And he seeks out um, this mentor figure, this father figure. And Larry activates something in Wallace's mind, something broken in his mind. He, uh, he admires this in Larry. He thinks that Larry did kill um, Cindy. Cindy Walker many years ago. And to Wallace, that makes Larry a kind of star. Part of what this book is doing, what Cricket Letter is doing, is commenting on the the part of, of American culture that admires um, serial killers. Serial killers who are imprisoned have fans. People write them letters. Um, and it, ours is a culture that almost rewards any kind of notoriety. And it's a terrific movie uh, about serial killers. Um, I can't think of the name of it now. I'm sorry. But it's about how they become famous as they go across country. And, you know, so I think that part of Wallace um, needs something. And he sees Larry as being able to give him what he needs. And when they finally begin to talk, um, it's well, Wallace just has so much to say. And Larry has so many questions for, for people. And what, what's interesting to me about Wallace, perhaps most interesting to me about Wallace, is that I was almost finished with the book, the first draft of Crooked Letter, Crooked Letter. And it occurred to me, I don't know who killed Tina Rutherford, the, the, the young woman who's missing at the first of the book, not Cindy, but Tina, the other girl. I didn't I, it occurred to me, wait a minute, somebody has to have kidnapped or killed her because she's missing. And that's what sets the book off, obviously. But I didn't know who did it. And suddenly I began to panic because really I'd written about 80% of the book. And I didn't know who did it. And in a way, you know, the book ha has as its question, who done it? Well, Wallace done it, but I didn't know that. So I began to think who might have been my, who might have been the killer? I had to look for, you know, the person has to be in the book already. You can't just bring in somebody at the end. That's not satisfying in fiction writing. You have to plant the person earlier in the book so that it will, you know, sprout leaves later. So um, I began to panic and think, you know, well, I thought maybe maybe Larry is really the killer. I entertained this idea for a number of days. Um, and I thought maybe Larry had a split personality, like um, like the kid and like, like the, the young man in Psycho or like um, the man in in um, Fight Club. But I thought, well, those two novels and then movies have already been made. I, I don't want to do that. I don't want to do a split personality. That seemed too easy in a way. So then I thought, okay. Maybe Silas is the killer. Silas was the last to be seen with Cindy. Silas is the one who sends Angie to check on Larry and find, and saves Larry's life. Silas discovers Tina Rutherford in that cabin. He's at every key moment of this book. Silas is there. He could have legitimately been the killer. But again, it didn't feel right. Um, one of my favorite rules is from Kurt Vonnegut Jr., who says you've always got to give your readers a character they can root for. And if Silas were this killer, we wouldn't root for him. And the same with Larry. We would root for them to be caught. So at some point, I thought, oh, the mill foreman, the lumber mill foreman is my bad guy. So I began to write a lot about that, but that didn't work either. It just it felt bad and wrong. I wrote about him. I gave him a wife with cancer and they got medical marijuana and she died and he, he went to harder and harder drugs. It just didn't feel, I felt the word was icky. It felt icky. So that didn't work either. And just as I was about to really panic down there in Bela Horizonte, Brazil, I remembered something. Um, I remembered a failed short story that I tried to write probably a dozen years before that. 
And the failed short story was about a little boy who was interested in, in a far neighbor through the woods, about a mile through the woods. And this person, this neighbor was an old man who everyone thought was a killer. And this little, this lonely boy went to try to find him and get to know him. And it occurred to me that my subconscious has known had known the story of Crooked Letter, Crooked Letter longer than my conscious did, because that short story, which never worked as a story, was exactly what I needed for my killer, for Crooked Letter, Crooked Letter. And suddenly I realized this little boy is my killer and the person he's, he's um, obsessed with is Scary Larry. And so suddenly I wrote about 30 pages in that day without even getting up. I wrote every scene of Larry and Wallace talking on Larry's porch and, and changed almost none of it. My subconscious had been ready to dump this on me when I finally realized it and I finally remembered it. And I had my uh, my culprit. I had my murderer. I had Wallace, who, you know, um, I find to be a very, very sad character. He is a broken human. He's a monster. But, you know, he is still the book says all monsters are misunderstood. And I, I, I believe that that sentiment. Thank you very much for this insight into the writing process. This is um, this is very, very interesting. Um, so you had a storyline, but you, I mean, in a way you didn't, you didn't know the, who, you, who the killer was. That's very interesting how you, how you developed this. this. Um, did you, and you also said now that when you wrote that uh, dial, those dialogues between Larry and uh, Wallace, you didn't have to change anything. But apart from that, um, did you have to change many things? Um, or is there anything you would like to change in backsight, in hindsight? Sorry. <laughs> One big thing that I changed um, is the ending. My mother, um, who died, uh, Three, I'll be three years in December. My mother was very proud of me and liked that I was a writer, but she never liked what I wrote. It was always, it's always been too dark for her. My first book, Poachers, is very dark. It's about a bunch of um, scary rednecks in Alabama doing terrible things to each other. And my first novel, Hell at the Breach, is about a gang of really terrorists in Alabama in the 1890s. My third book for a second novel is Smunk. It's about a terrible, terrible, terrible human being named E.O. Smunk. Um, but my mother just, you know, she said, it's. I can see it's well written and I admire the writing, but I wish I liked the people more. So I really hoped before she died or I died, I could write a happy ending for her. And it seemed like Crooked Letter, Crooked Letter might be the chance. So just before we left Brazil, I sat down there at my, where I worked one day for about three hours and I wrote a happy ending mm -hmm. and I will describe it to you. It's after the book is over. Um, it, Larry was sitting on a Sunday morning uh, in his chair in his living room by himself, like always, watching um, a TV preacher preaching you know they have televised services on Sundays in this country and um he's sitting there and he hears a car pull up actually a jeep pull up and it's Silas and Angie in Silas's jeep and they say come come Larry you come into church with us go to Angie's church and Larry says I don't I, I can't you know I'm, I'm not really and they say no no you're coming and so Larry goes into his closet and gets his father's suit puts it on it fits him and he rides to Angie's church. This is an all black church, Baptist church. And they get out and in the, <clears throat> excuse me, in the churchyard, everyone's standing around getting ready to go inside to have their service. And Larry sees Jackie, Jackie Simmons, who he told, said a terrible thing to when he was younger. Mm -hmm. And he walks up to her and apologizes and she forgives him. And she introduces him to all her grandchildren and then everyone moves inside and Larry and Silas and Angie are on the third pew on the right side and, every, and they sit down and then the music begins and everyone stands up. But Larry has found out that his legs have no feeling and he can't stand up. He's, he's just gone weak. 
from emotion. And Silas looks down and sees that Larry isn't standing. So Silas sits beside Larry and the music is getting louder and more beautiful. And Silas puts his arm around Larry like this. And um, Larry starts to cry and Silas is crying and Angie's crying. And I was crying as I wrote this terrible, terrible, terrible scene. And, and I, I finished it, you know, with music and tears. And I remember um, I showed it to my wife and she said, oh, my God, this is the worst crap. You can't let this be your ending. And I realized she was right. So I sent that ending to my mother and said, Mom, this won't be the book's ending, but here's a happy ending I wrote for you. And she was she was glad about that. And the book, I then wrote the ending it has now, which is much more muted, but still, I hope offers glimmers of possibility, glimmers of hope for these two characters, because they do plan to meet again the next day. It's a and, and, so the second part of you, the second part of your question, uh, Inga, I, I, what, I, I probably, yeah, I regret a few things about the book now. I regret some of the language. I regret. I think I could have pulled back on some of the bad language. Um, the, uh, a local high school, um, the, the high school here in Oxford, the public school, is just about a half a mile from my house, and they were going to use Crooked Letter as their high their high school reading book, and, and I even arranged for, with my publisher to have books sent to them for free but one mother read the book and did not like the very graphic description of tina rutherford's body and and pull the plug and so and and none of them read it um and the books just went back to the publisher um it, you know I, I regret perhaps that moment of of um maybe it was more graphic than it needed to be um i just you know i think i, I think i could have made the book pg-13 instead of r and it would have had a few more readers. That's all. Oh, okay. Um, thinking of changing your book just to please the reader. That sounds very that nice. sounds questionable. I, I understand. Um, it just it made me so sad. You know, I was gonna go talk to talk to all these high school students. It made me so sad. And so probably that you know it's wrong to think like that, to think, you know. But I can tell you here um, in the privacy of Zoom that the reason I use that graphic description is because, um, you know, as I wrote this book, I became friends with police officers. And these police officers would send me pictures of crime scenes so I could use them. Mm -hmm. And the pictures were so horrific. What, you know, what um, violence and time can do to the human body as it as it. Um, what it dissolves as it were it's, it's amazing and i just saw these pictures and i thought these are so incredible that i need to you know i need to try to describe them it seemed to me that this is you know part of something silas would have seen and I, and if i turned away um in a way I, I, that would be cowardice cowardice on the writer's part to not look things straight on but to look a, a, you know slantly at something a scant at something I would, I would consider that to be um, writerly cowardice. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's see. talk about some of the themes of the novel. Um, one of them is masculinity. Is masculinity a topic really in the novel? Is it important, an important topic? Very much so. Um, you know, Carlot is the consummate man. He is a mechanic. He works with his hands. He's gregarious. He's charismatic. He, you know, he hunts with uh, uh, with guns. He has all these guns. He is big and brash and tough. He's emblematic of the men I grew up, uh, the white men I grew up um, admiring might not be the right word, but I grew up noticing. Mm -hmm. Uh, he he is at home in his world. When he's at his shop, he's in command. He's unhappy when he's at home because he doesn't like his wife and he doesn't like his kid. But at his shop, when he's telling stories and holding court, he's at his happiest. He's in his element. And so he's, I think, a, a key symbol, um, a personification of masculinity, and Larry is not masculine. Larry has the effeminate features of his mother and of his effeminate uncle, whom Carl despises and detests. 
So um, Carl, you know, as, as a masculine symbol is what Larry, you know, in some way aspires to. And what Silas has automatically, it seems, Silas in Larry's eyes is easily masculine, where Larry has trouble with it. And, and, and I think the novel's biggest masculine symbol, though, is the rifle, which plays a key plot role. Um, Larry loaning Silas that rifle in chapter three, I think, when they first, you know, when they first are becoming friends, is Larry is it is an um, an example of Larry's desperation. It's dangerous for him to give this rifle over because it doesn't really belong to him. It belongs to his father. But Larry is so desperate for friendship that he says, "Here, uh, take this." But I have to get it back. He doesn't get it back for about twenty five years. But also because that rifle is missing, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> because that rifle is missing. Carl understands what's happened with Larry and Silas. And he says, get my rifle back. And Larry has to go get it back. And Carl actually follows him through the woods. And this shows two things. It shows what a good woodsman Carl is to even be drunk, but to be so quiet and stealthy that Larry doesn't hear him behind him. And Larry to be so clueless as to walk in the woods and not notice a drunk man following him. And then, uh, of course, Carl makes the two boys fight over the rifle, and Larry is is bested. And now, of course, Carl knows that Silas is his illegitimate son, and Carl believes in his heart that a father's job is to train his son in the art of masculinity, the art of shooting a rifle. And in this way, he engineers um, himself giving the rifle to Silas, because whoever wins the fight gets the rifle. Mm -hmm. He knows Silas is going to win. Everybody knows Silas is going to win. And so Carlotte is able to give his son a rifle. Um, and I think at the end, Silas returning the rifle uh, just closes a circle opened by the rifle. You know, um, if you have a gun at the beginning, it has to matter by the end. And this gun matters thematically. It never goes off per se but it matters thematically to Larry's life and, and ends up being a very long phallic um, masculine symbol. By the way, what's the age difference between Larry and Silas? Are they the same age? Which one is older? Is Larry older or is Silas older? There's a question uh, here. I have a question concerning their age. Silas must be older than Larry since Alice was Larry's maid. That sounds right. Here's the sad thing. So many of the small things I've just forgotten. <clears throat> you know, I wrote, wrote this in 2010. Mm -hmm. That's like 13 years ago. But here's the beautiful thing about, about German students reading. German students have found a number of things like that where someone's age is this, this thing on one page, on page 14, and on page 270, the age has changed. That's just me not being able to fit. The whole book won't fit in my head. See, it, the book is wider than my head. A novel can't fit in your head. It's a novel is this wide, and your head is only this wide. So I got a few things wrong. Back to your original question, I, I one of your earlier questions, what would I change? I would try to get make all the numbers add up. Mm -hmm. I do think that, that there are a couple of times where things are just wrong. Somebody's eyes are blue here and green here. Just that I, you know, I forget. I forgot. And what's interesting to me is I read the book over and over again. My wife reads it. My agent reads it. My editor reads it. The copy editor reads it. A marketing executive reads it. Um, and then these things are not caught. These people's jobs are to catch these things, especially the copy editor. The copy editor is the person who reads the book so closely. They make notes of everything. But sadly, copy editors are not very good anymore, and they don't notice these things the way they should. They mainly just correct your grammar and your punctuation. And the truth is, I'm, I've been writing for so long that if my grammar or punctuation, if they're incorrect, it's because I made them that way. I want them to be incorrect for some reason. A great example of that is on the book's first page, I think, 
um, it, uh, Larry has barbed wire around his property, B-A-R-B-E-D, barbed wire. It's the wire with little sharp nails twisted around. So, you know, that, uh, that it keeps animals in and predators out. So barbed wire. But the way people say it, where I'm from, they say bob wire. Not barbed wire, but bob wire. So I spelled it B-O-B wire. And I got so many incensed, angry emails because I used um, a colloquial sound. I spelled it phonetically. It really bothered people. So, you know, I, I just like things like that, I, I probably would uh, would change just to avoid the emails from people. <laughs> and having to answer them or not. Right. <laughs> Sometimes don't I don't even answer. answer <laughs> okay, we've talked about the rifle and um, and its meaning. Um, of course, the rifle is also a symbolic of, a, of an American problem, namely gun control. And there was the question whether you personally believe that there should be stricter gun control. Very much. I think we we see every day that we need stricter gun control. How I many we've had more than one shooting every day in this country, more than one every day. So um, what it, there have been what um, 31, 37 or 38 days. We've had more shootings than that. I think it's a, a plague in this country. Um, but I don't know how we're going to get rid of it. I mean, my, you know, I have friends who have dozens of guns. And guess what? They're really good people. My brother, who has a safe filled with guns, is a great human. I, you know, I, I love him. Um, and he's a responsible gun owner. But man, there's just so many. And no, I, I think that um, we need to throw them all. We need to put them in a rocket and fire them toward the sun just to get rid of them or something. I think that we're out of control over here. Do, do you see a life without guns for America? <laughs> Um, I guess not. Um, I, I think it's part of, it's ingrained in our culture. You know, we are conquerors. I, I say that very, very, um, ironically. Um, you know, I think that Americans are so afraid of having things taken away from them, our precious rights. You know, mm -hmm. nobody minds that we have laws for cars a lot of laws for cars. Nobody minds that, but they don't want any laws for the guns. I just don't understand it. And I, you know, uh, I think it's terrible. I hate it. Mm -hmm. At least favorite thing to talk about. Mm -hmm. The other serious problem in the U S and especially in the U S South, of course, is racism. And, um, well, it's, it's so present still. Do you think the, your book um, addresses this and has some, you know, meaningful role or something to say, something to to change people's views of uh, racism. I hope so. I, I would say that racism is everywhere in my country, not just the South. We're famous for it, but it's everywhere. The worst racist I ever knew was from Detroit, Michigan. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when I started writing this book, uh, Crooked Letter, I was writing about my own brother and me. <clears throat> this is Jeff again, mm -hmm. back here. Mm -hmm. He is a mechanic like my father was. He works in the shop that my father built. Um, my uncles, the ones who are living are mechanics too. My cousins are. So we're a big family of mechanics. Um, so Jeff and I have very different lives. He can't quite believe that my job is to come and teach two classes a week. That's your whole job, your whole job. You teach a class on, on Tuesday, one on, you teach two, two classes Tuesday and two classes Thursday, one at 11 o'clock, one at one o'clock Tuesday, 11 and one on Thursday. That is my job. There's a lot more to my job than that, which he doesn't understand, but he is so different from me. Uh, he's Republican, I'm Democrat. Uh, he he still hunts, has all the guns. I don't. Um, but we're still really close. And whenever I visit him, we get together at his house in his backyard around a, a big barrel where he had, where he burns wood and we talk and drink beer and tell stories. 
And if I needed him, he would drop whatever he's doing and drive the five hours north to see me. I would do the same for him. So I was just, I'm, I'm just fascinated by how different we are, yet joined at the roots by our shared history. So I was, this is what I was writing about. And I, was, and I had two images. An image, you know, is, is um, a picture in your mind. Uh, well, I had one image. It was a, a mechanics automotive repair shop, but with no customers. In Grove Hill, where my father had his first shop, um, my brother has one in Mobile now. They moved from Grove Hill to Mobile when I was 18. But my father, um, um, my father had a shop there in Grove Hill, and a mile south was his brother-in-law, my uncle Edward, who had also had a shop. But my uncle Edward had no customers. Ooh never had customers. My father's shop was always filled with cars that didn't work, with the hoods up, with wheels off, tires off. And I, my dad would send me to the parts house, to the automotive parts house, where you go to get brake shoes or a carburetor kit or whatever. And I would drive up there and I would pass my uncle's uh, uh, shop with no customers. And I would drive back and no customers. Um, that uncle died and his son, my cousin Robbie, took over that shop. And Robbie is in a lot of ways, um, <clears throat> you know, Larry Ott's based on me, but also my cousin Robbie, because Robbie took over that shop and Robbie never had customers. And uh, he died about less than a year ago. My cousin died mm -hmm. and that shop is now closed, but it's the shop I, I describe in Crooked Letter, Crooked Letter. It's got the white and the green paint and it's got the the, the gas pumps with um old prices because that's how that shop is and um <clears throat> what's funny is if my cousin weren't you know we're still alive he would be sitting at that shop right now with no customers um there's one caveat though when people read crooked letter some of them in in, in the area recognized robbie and his shop and so they started going to him to get their oil changed so i sent my cousin some business there toward <laughs> the end of his life and i'm happy about that but <laughs> really funny uh, <laughs> again we saw how much of your own life and life experience went into the book but of course got changed around thank you for this um, maybe we could talk a little bit about the role of women could you comment on the role of women in the book not only the dead women but the ones living the mothers. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> the role of women in, in this book is, is mainly supportive, which is, you know, I, I wish that were not the case. You know, um, it's the story of Silas and Larry. And so um, every other character, I think, you know, it's a secondary character, some tertiary characters. But, you know, but the three I think of are Alice Jones and Ina Ott and Angie. Um, Silas's girlfriend, I can't remember her last name now, but they are all in supportive roles. Um, and I, I certainly perhaps, you know, some women readers might prefer, as would I, they had stronger roles. But that was the book. That was the story of Crooked Letter. It was the story of these two men and of their mothers in, in an ancillary way and, you know, and, and Silas's girlfriend in an ancillary way. But but the women are supporting the men. One thing that I know about my writing is it would be stronger with stronger women characters. So the book I'm doing now has two or the I'm, I'm writing a long story right now. It has two very strong uh, women characters, you know, and what, one thing I would change, I guess, is that. But I don't know how I would change the characters without changing the whole book, because really it's about Silas and Larry. And they these are the ones who I, I go very deeply into their psychologies. They're the only two point of view characters. Point of view is the perspective from which the story is told. So chapter one is um, in Larry's point of view. Chapter two is Silas's point of view. We're only in Silas's head. We never head hop, except when the chapter changes. Um, and the only time, you know, at the chapters um, uh, change, uh, Larry, Silas, Larry, Silas, from one to 18, Chapter 19, I think it is, has both points of view in it, because at this point, they're coming together. And so instead of breaking the, the, the two characters into their own chapters, 
I keep them connected. So technically, I'm joining them as the writer in a chapter where they had been separated before. So I hope that's another small way of showing them coming together because it's in Larry's point of view and then it goes to Silas's point of view and ends finally in Larry's point of view. Mm -hmm. Right. Can we also talk a little bit about the women, although they're only secondary characters? I mean, of course, they are books about um, these two males, but they're influenced by, by the women, aren't they? I mean, uh, the mother, for example, I mean, Larry's mother, uh, why is she not, why couldn't she be stronger? Or, or how does she really influence Larry's sense of belonging? She loves him. Mm -hmm. She loves him. And that's, you know, the best constant in his life. Um, she doesn't dislike him the way his father does. You know, neither boy has a father, really. You know, um, I think Silas is envious of Larry's father, Carl Ott. But then if would you want that father? Are you better off without a father than that toxic father? Mm -hmm. You know, I don't know who has who has it best, who mm -hmm. has it worst in that case. Um, but certainly Ina sees her role as protecting Larry. She is, she understands that Carl doesn't like either of them. And because of that, <clears throat> she tries to overcompensate, I think, and love Larry perhaps too much and might even have, you know, contributed to him, him being soft as Carl would see because she mothered him. I think Carl probably sees Larry as a as a mama's boy. You know, Larry needs glasses. He has bloody noses and, and and asthma. All these weaknesses that Carl doesn't have, and Carl sees those as feminine. Um, so in in this way, I think Larry is more of a feminist, certainly than his father, because he has had this good role model. Um, I think with Alice Jones, Alice is in a much more fraught situation. She is simply trying first to get herself some place to live, walls around her and a ceiling over her head, a roof. Uh, and then she has to get wheels. She's reduced to the most basic, but what she does is fights herself up from having to flee a dangerous situation in the North back to the South where she knows she has agency. She knows Carl Ott is there. She knows Carl owes her. And so she goes to Carl's house, that old cabin that she knows about. And within a day or two, you, you may notice that she has a car. She gets that from Carl, of course. Nobody knows that. Ina doesn't know that. She may suspect it, but she doesn't know it. And pretty soon, um, Alice has gotten them out of that cabin into a real place to live. So she's just fighting hard for the most basic things. And I see her as being a very brave person. I see Ina as being brave as well. Both of them are fighting against these circumstances um, that aren't fair. Angie, um, who I see as the third, uh, of, you know, of, of this sort of trio of women, Angie's got it together. Angie calls Silas on his shit. Angie says, you know, you mess with your hat when you lie. She sees the goodness in him, but she needs him to be better she needs him to to i think rise to the level that she thinks he can and so she's i think taken up alice's jones a alice's role in trying to make him better and stronger would you rather live a life as larry or as silas lack of father for both courageous women but different types of women uh, as mothers mm. which life that's, would you prefer that's an interesting question i have not been asked that before mm. that came up in the chat <laughs> well whoever asked that thank you um most questions i've heard before that's a new one um i got i have to say this since you know in so many ways i lived larry's life uh, I think I'd be more interested in, in being, you know, in, in seeing Silas's. I think I, I think I'd be more interested in in, in being him than Larry because I, I just know, you know, I mean, I did. 
you know, so much of Larry's sadness is part of my past. Uh, I don't regret it now, but it was very hard to endure at the time. Silas, of course, endured a lot of other hardships and hardnesses. Um, but I think it might be kind of cool to be someone like Silas who goes through his life with more confidence. Mm -hmm. Every his life head on in a way that Larry isn't able to because of fear. Mm -hmm. Every second chapter is written from Silas's point of view, you told us earlier on, and of course we also know. And, um, but what was it like to step into a, you know, a black character and write from his point of view? It was, it was scary. I'll tell you this, I would not, I would never have thought to do that. Way back when I was, I mentioned earlier, um, the book was about two brothers. Uh, and I was going to say, um, I, I forgot, I got away from myself. The two images were, a mechanic with, with no um, customers and a small town police officer. Those were going to be the two brothers, a mechanic with no customers and a small town cop. And I was going to have um, one of them go to jail, prison for some reason, and the other had to help. Um, and <clears throat> excuse me. And I was um, talking with another writer friend of mine. Writers frequently talk about ideas with each other and try to help each other tell stories because before you know, before this was written, the story didn't exist. I didn't know what the events were. I didn't even know who the characters were, really. I was trying to learn. What a writer, writer does is learn the story as they're telling it. And so I was talking to my friend David Wright Falliday. Uh, He's an amazing novelist. Um, and he and I were talking about our books. He talked about his for a while, and then I talked about mine. And I said, I can't make it work. Uh, it didn't have a title yet. It wasn't called Crooked Letter, Crooked Letter yet. It didn't have a title at all. All I knew was two brothers, small town cop, mechanic, no customers. And I was telling David this. And David said to me something that changed my life. Because David said this. I'm talking to y'all right now. David said, make the cop a black guy. And I said, whoa, I would never do that. I would never can even um, dare Dane to uh, write from another point of view. You know, what right do I have to imagine myself being a black man? And David said, you have every right as long as you do it well. Do a good job with it. It'll be fine. He said, in fact, when you get when you get it written, send it to me and I'll read it for you. And I said, OK, I knew his idea was right. I knew it was the right thing to do for the book. It would make it a book about something other than just two brothers. It would suddenly become about race relations. It would give the book a more important theme, a more memorable theme. But also, I knew it'd be harder to write. So I began to, to, to you know, to write uh, as Silas, and it, it was very difficult. And I thought more and more about David. He and I are very close. Um, and I remembered a conversation we had had many years before this. We lived in a small Illinois town, same town that David lived in. And his at the time, his wife, he's now divorced. Um, but David and I met one night at a bar and we we're having beers and talking. And he suggested that my wife and I use the maid, the housekeeper that he and his wife were using. He said, I know, I know, you know, none of us thinks we should have a housekeeper, but it gives you so much more time to write. So I said, OK, so we, you know, we hired um David and Audrey's housekeeper. She was a white woman and she came to our house. You know, my wife and I are white. David, and his wife were black. The housekeeper was white. And she came and began, she became our housekeeper. And about a week after she started working for us, David and I met somewhere and he said to me, will she clean your toilets? And I said, yeah, why? He said, she won't clean our toilets. And that one detail let me know that every day David felt on some level like a second class American that some some small thing like that would happen to him every day he came to visit um, us once in Illinois my mother-in-law was visiting when she saw a black man at the door it frightened her and David saw this and I know that you know that how, how do you not internalize this how does it not make you angry? I don't know how he can be such a happy, loving human. It would make me so angry. Um, but with David's permission, I, I 
I had stumbled into writing Silas as a black man. Uh, one thing I noticed about the point of view is if the character is white and they see a person coming, they will say uh, a woman approached. And that means a white woman. Mm -hmm. If the if the point of view character is black and they see a person ap approach, that's a black person. They the, the race would identify the other race. Mm -hmm. So a white man would identify a black man walking up. A black man would identify a white woman walking up. Mm -hmm. This is all going through my head, along with these other things I'm thinking about. And I just I just wrote and wrote, and finally I just started writing Silas as a human. And that's when I was able to finally get most of Silas down and get him on the page. And when I sent the manuscript to David, he called me and we had a very, for me, um, tense conversation. He was never tense, but he would say the N words. She would not say N word. She would think black. So where I got it wrong, he told me. He's such a good friend, and we've been friends for you know um, over 20 years. He knows my heart, that there's not a racist bone in my body, that the characters would say these words. But if the character, if it wasn't true how the character said it, he would tell me. So, you know, in this way, um, the book became a better book, thanks to David's suggestion, thanks to his help. And he's thanked in the back of the book as, you know, as one of its early readers. You just mentioned the N-word. Some people may have trouble find it find it hard to read that work in your book. Yes. Two things about that. One, um, the people I write about would use that word. And in not using it, but sparingly, the writing is less honest than it otherwise would be. <clears throat> that said, um, the word should be very carefully considered every time it's used in fiction. And I did uh, consider it every time it's used in my book, David vetted it. So I think that in that way, um, I'm okay with it, but <clears throat> excuse me, I'm so sorry. Um, uh, but it is a word that needs to be, well, I said this deeply considered and I'll tell you a story um, of maybe a year ago. I got an email from a student here in Mississippi. I have an, um, an, uh, a university email, so anyone in the world can find me and send me emails, and they do. And this one came from, um, I think she was a junior, a young black woman in a school in Jackson, about two, hour, two and a half hours south of here. She wrote, Dear Mr. Franklin, I had to read your book, Crooked Letter, Crooked Letter for a class. I would just like to say, disrespectfully, fuck you. That's what she wrote to me. And I wrote her back and said, well, it, it, it shocked me and it made me sad. Um, and I thought about it for a couple of days. And then I wrote her back and said, um, I'm sorry if my book offended you. What was so, what exactly made you feel this way that you would write this note to a total stranger? And she wrote back and, and in a, a longer note. And it said, why should I, young black woman, have to listen to the N word from an old white man? That's a hard, honest, blunt question. And I wrote her a three page letter in response. And I told her I would never have thought to do that without my friend David suggesting it and without my friend David vetting it. And I apologized for using the word and offending her. And I said, as I said before, if it's not in the book, the book is not honest. And that honesty is, is to me worth it. And some readers may close the book when, it, when they get to that word or other words. I can't help that. I can only write the most honest book that I can write. Um, and I told this all to this young woman and she wrote me yet another note back and thanked me and apologized. She said, and I apologized for my first rude email. And, you know, and we ended it on a very good note. And in that way, the book reached her and she and I had a communication that we wouldn't have otherwise ha have had. So in that way, the book is doing work by making a young black woman reach out to an old white man and us having a talk about it. If it hadn't been there, we wouldn't have had that connection. Did so the, please. Did the book also change your view of black Americans? Very much so, because I understood just remembering the things 
that every you know, that I think every Black American feels daily, and that white Americans don't feel daily. Mm-hmm. One of the things I realized is that in America, you can be white and never once think about race relations, but mm-hmm. if you're Black, you think of it every day. Mm-hmm. Um, it, you know, people. I drive down the road in my. Uh, Kia tell you ride with impunity. You know, I know that I'm I'm legal. I've got a driver's license. I don't have any kind of contraband in my car. I don't have a gun in there. If I get stopped, I'm going to be pissed off. Why? Why'd you stop me, you cop? If a black person gets stopped, their life is in danger. Mm-hmm. This happens so much as we see over and over again. I bet you've seen the horrific footage that happened in Memphis. An hour and 10 minutes from where I sit, Tyree Nichols was beat to death by five cops. I mean, this is a problem. Guns and racism, not not a good thing together, not a good combination. So I think that with this book taking on a hard topic, it put itself into a larger national conversation. Um, and I'm, I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful that David Wright suggested, David Wright Faladay suggested this to me. And here I am now talking to you because of that decision to make Silas a black guy. Mm-hmm. That situation in, in the car being held up by the police, that's the reason why black parents have to give the talk, what they the call talk. The talk to their children when they're not yet 10 years old. I mean, it's horrible, isn't it? Yeah. Yes, it is. It makes yeah. me ashamed. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, there was one more question here, which is interesting. What are the three, I mean, I suppose there are more questions that are interesting. I don't see them all. What are the three most important messages from the book, messages from the book that we should take away? Are there three? Okay, I'll try to come up with three. Mm -hmm. One is, I hope that it's a good story. You know, I want it to be a fun story. That's why we read, why I write is to be entertaining. I want to, I I know that all of you students have to read the book and I'm sorry about that. Maybe it's not entertaining if you have to read it, but other people read it because it's in their book club or they choose to. So I I want them to get the message that, you know, this is a a good story. I want that to be part of it. Um, Another thing is, this idea of race relations that we've been talking about. Mm-hmm. I want people to understand that there are connections underlying us, that we're still people, no matter what color our skin is. We may have a father in common or a place in common or something else in common, but underneath this pigment, we all have blood and we all have these same organs trying to work. Mm-hmm. So I would say that I hope people would, you know, would understand that we're just the same. And finally, I hope that people would, if if there's a character like Scary Larry that you know of in your life, there's somebody um, who you've kept at arm's distance because of something you've heard, maybe what you've heard is wrong. That person has his or her or their own point of view, their own story. And to them, their story is everything. So hopefully it will make people look at other people, not just people of other races, but of their own race, a little more kindly and with less judgment. You know, everybody's got a Scary Larry in their life somewhere, but Scary Larry and others like Scary Larry um, have an interior life life themselves. Mm -hmm. What what made you want to become a writer when did you realize that you wanted to become a writer well i had that thing called a love of reading i loved to read and because i loved to read so much and it made me so happy i can't i could not think of anything better to do than try to make others as happy as those books made me so I began to imitate the books, um, uh, <clears throat> your books like um, Conan the Barbarian by Robert E. Howard and um, H.P. Lovecraft, try to write scary stories. And I tried to write Tarzan stories and I wrote Star Trek stories. I, I, I realized now that I was an early practitioner of fan fiction. 
Mm-hmm. We just called it plagiarism back then. Now it's called fan fiction. But I would write with other people's characters. I wrote many Star Trek stories with Captain Kirk and Mr. Spock and Dr. McCoy, Lieutenant Uhura, and all the other characters, and Tarzan stories. In the 10th grade, I wrote my very first original story. It was it's it was copied. I took an event out of um Tarzan at the Earth's core. I think Tarzan number 13. I took it, I took an event out of that and used it in my story. So in a way, I still plagiarized, but I finished it. I wrote a whole story. And then over the next several years, I wrote about a hundred more stories, and they were all terrible. <laughs> Finally, I wrote one that was a little less terrible and a little less terrible, and they got better. But there are still those hundred stories out there that are not good. And I learned how to write by writing bad stories. That's what a writer does. Learns to write by writing bad stories. And um, I love to read Stephen King. If you can see behind me, I'll show you. From here down to here. All of it's Stephen King. All, all Stephen King books. I think, I think every book of his is there, I think. And I've read most of them. And I read them as they came out when I was a kid. But then I read uh, an interview with Stephen King. And the interview said that he knows his own writing is the literary equivalent of a Big Mac and French fries. So fast food. That's fast food. And I had this writing, reading epiphany. I thought... I can't be a good writer if I only read the equivalent of fast food. I need to read better food, right? Better mental food. So I began to read on my own the books I should have read in high school. Um, And like To Kill a Mockingbird. You know, I grew up 45 minutes from Harper Lee, the woman who wrote To Kill a Mockingbird. I lived 45 minutes from her and didn't know who she was. I could have gone to see her in her house if I had known who she was, but I hadn't read those books. So on my own, I began to read them. And um, with a better reading, you know, diet, I became, I began to imitate better books. Mm -hmm. And I read um, a a writer called Barry Hanna, who, believe it or not, used to teach right here. His office was he's dead now but his office was one story above mine that's where his office was and i'm right below him now or where he was rather and um when i found his fiction i couldn't believe how good the sentences were the stories were good the novels were good as were stephen king's but where stephen king would use cliches Mm -hmm. barry hannah would put together sentences that i'd never imagined he would put words with other words and the effect was poetry. So I'd never read, excuse me, I never read poetry written like fiction before. And that's what I wanted to do. And then I read a writer named Raymond Carver. Mm -hmm. And Carver was what was called a minimalist. Mm -hmm. His stories were about blue collar people like I was, who were very poor. I didn't realize you could write about poor people who had jobs. That's what Carver did. And he writes it in a really simple, a seemingly and deceptively simple style. So it seems like you could imitate it easily. So I began to imitate Barry Hanna and Raymond Carver. One is an overwriter, one's an underwriter. And somewhere in the middle, I discovered what I wanted to be, how I wanted to write. Um, And I still love Stephen King. You know, it's okay to get a Big Mac and French fries once in a while, but (laughs) mainly I read literary fiction these days. and you know, and and I write. I hope literary fiction. Yeah. Very last question: What are your plans for the future? A sequel, perhaps, to? <laughs> no, I, I, I'm not a sequel. I'm I'm finishing, as I said earlier, a really long story. <clears throat> Look, I'll show you something. Stay here. One more. One more visual aid. This, oh, this is a failed novel. Okay. <laughs> you look at here. I've got a map. There's pages and pages. Ooh. Notes. Okay. Notes. I worked on this oh, novel. Written, are they? <laughs> I worked on that novel in Berlin in 2016. I worked on it since, 
and it has failed. My wife, agent, and editor have all said, give it up. Mm-hmm. But I've, it was 600 pages in six years. It's like a, it's like ending a marriage mm-hmm. or something. And I can't give it up. What I'm doing is I'm trying to make a long story out of part of it. And that long story will be um, a novella. And, it, and I'll put other stories with it for a book of short stories. For the future, I'm trying desperately to finish that. I want to make this giant box into a 142-page novella. Novella. Um, uh, Other feature. I I have classes today at 11 and 1. I'll teach those. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, thank you very much for this great talk, Tom. It was very nice talking to you again. And you too, Inga. Thank Thank you, Sophia. And thank you, students and teachers. I really appreciate your attention. Yes, exactly. Thank you all so much for this interesting event. Uh, Thanks for answering all the questions, Tom. And of course, thanks to all the teachers and students who are active today. And I hope that you have enjoyed the last 90 minutes and can benefit from it. If you have missed part of today's event or um, if you want to rewatch it, just feel free to um, go to our uh, YouTube channel. I will keep the video online. You can also tell your friends uh, or students who couldn't make it that they also get a chance to prepare for the Abitur in the best possible way. And if you like what we do and want to know more, you can also follow us on social media and or subscribe to our newsletter. So thank you all for watching. I wish you all the best for your exams. Have a nice day. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone.